we will uh, we will chat a little bit more about what Akrit has built. Um, and I've known him for now about five years, yeah. maybe. Um, from the early days of Haptic to today, uh, building the world's largest conversational AI business platform, sorry, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so a lot of people here, people have come down from South Mumbai all the way to from San Francisco. So, you know. Yeah, South, Mumbai, South Mumbai is far, yeah. Excellent. Um, so look, you know, I uh, found myself in the middle of, um, or we found ourselves in the middle of the AI firestorm, not really calling it AI. It was ML, NLP, deep science, you name it. Um, and Akrit knows about this, uh, building what we believe today is still the largest exit in ed tech, uh, an AI-led ed tech platform called Imbibe, uh, which we exited last year. And I think we've been incredibly fortunate as a team and as a you know firm Lightbox to have gained uh, tremendous insights, which is also one of the reasons why we thought it would be great to get this group together. There is a new AI-led idea on everything. And actually, it's been hard for us sometimes to decipher what's, what's real and what's not, and what's actually gonna have impact and what's not. Um, and so, you know, as we, as we sort of think about this a little bit further um, and, and think about haptic, maybe something that I'd love to understand and maybe everybody else also is, one, you know, at what point did you transform, because haptic wasn't always in, I never saw the words AI when I first met you. In fact, I don't think we had AI as a vocabulary five years ago. Yeah, we changed with the times. There you go. But what, what, what specifically changed and led you to change to transform this platform? And second of all is answering this question, if you can think about the following, which is what, because you have customers today and you had customers yesterday, and, and some of them are the same customers, I'm assuming. What were those customers not able to do or, or, or what are they not able to do yesterday, which they're able to do today? because you're now the world's leading conversational AI platform. Yeah, so just adding to your uh, first point around, you know, um, startup pitches being very sort of AI centric, right? And I think what we were trying to do over there was, you know, our take or what we also realized along the way is that um, I think, uh, you know, in the previous session, Sandeep spoke about this uh, and they said, you know, AI is really an enabler, right? AI is like a set of tools, right? And the question is, you know, today when you think of building a new product, right, you don't all you don't say I have to build this as a mobile app. You think about where's your audience gonna be, where are they gonna transact, where are they gonna engage, and that could very well be on a website or a mobile website, in which case you mean that you may not need a mobile app. I think it's the same case with, you know, AI, right, which is that uh, it's an enabler to accomplish a certain product or a solution for a specific customer or an audience, right? So if somebody is building a really cool doorknob, you know, your real question is not, what's the AI that's gone into it? Your real question is who's really gonna use it, right? By the way, we have one over there. Is that an AI enabled doorknob? It's definitely an IoT enabled doorknob. Does it, does it work when you just talk to it, like open the door? No? Not yet. Okay, cool, yeah. all right. Uh, so we have to get there, right? That's a market. That's, that's, that's probably a, a big market. So, you know, Coming and then answering your specific question about sort of what happened with us, um, you know, we've, you know, for those who've followed us closely and, you know, you've obviously, we've been in touch over the years, we've gone through, you know, a fair share of twists, turns, classic pivots along the way. And uh, I think for us, what happened is that, you know, coming back to the, what I was talking about, we found a, a specific part of AI or certain specific uh, tools or algorithms within AI that we felt could deliver a platform or a product uh, that could eventually genuinely create ROI or business sense for our customer. You know, that's basically what happened, where we found that, okay, look, if we use these components of AI or these algorithms, if we use them and package the product really well, it could have a significant impact to our customer. And fortunately, at least ever since we made this real pivot or shift, which has been give and take two and a half years, that's worked out for us, right? And that, we, you know, yeah. while I think everybody appreciates that and sounds really good, um, I think as, as investors, we also hear some of this same stuff. So um, the thing that we find difficult is to really 
you know, bite into something with substance. Mm -hmm. So is there something you can share that maybe is more specific? Maybe give an example of a client. I don't know if you can name somebody or not, yeah. but it'd be great to understand something that a client of yours was having a tough time accomplishing yesterday, mm -hmm. which now because of what you've changed and evolved into, you're actually able to drive. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so two parts to answer that question again, right? So the first part is, you know, as an investor or as an investor rather, how do you how do you distinguish between what's real and quote unquote what's faff? Right. right? Exactly. That's, that's yep. really the question. And just like any other business, right? I think, you know, you guys obviously do this really well. You know, you look for Thank proof. you. <laughs> you look for uh, I have to be in, I'm in your office, right? So, um, you know, you have to look for what? You look, you look for proof of concept. You look for case study. You look for data. You look to see that are people using it? Are customers using it? Are people coming back? I don't think any of those fundamentals change, right? And I don't think anything changes just because you're an AI company. Ultimately, you have to, and we made that mistake, by the way. So I'll come to the case study, right? But we made that mistake where you know, for a while when we made that shift, we were so focused on getting the AI component right, we actually forgot about the end customer's problem, right? And everybody just went into cracking like some piece that we could patent and write a paper on, which we eventually did. But it, you know, it was a bit of a digression from, you know, really thinking about, are we really solving the end customer's problem? And that, you know, was an important shift that we did. And to your point about a specific case study, so my favorite one, which is, you know, I think we give an example of this, it's public also on our website, is Dream 11, right? Um, now, of course, okay. everybody knows about Dream 11 uh, because they're very big, but when we started working with them two years back, um, nobody knew how big they were until we found out how big they were even two years back. So Dream 11 had a unique problem where basically during a specific part of the year, which is now, which is the IPL, right? Their traffic shoots up like 10x or 15x because of the nature of the game. Um, so what they had to do was only for this time period of six to eight weeks uh, to handle their customer support volume, which would shoot up also by six to eight x, they would have to hire an additional like 70, 80 people only for six to eight weeks, right? So only for six to eight weeks, they would have to staff up their customer support by 70, 75, 80 odd people, just so that they can match the volume. So what AI did and that's our business, which is conversational AI, we basically built or implemented a solution for them that was an automated customer support handling chatbot. Where what that did is took all of their customer support data, took a bunch of their FAQs, put it into our system, implemented on a platform, such that when people have a customer support request, they can first chat on this live chat AI enabled application, try and get their query resolved. And if it did not work, then of course it can pass on to a human agent. And when you mean chat, you mean typing it out physically? Yes. Typing it out and actually asking, saying, hey, my account is not working. Right. Dream 11 has a unique issue where their app is not available on Google Play. I'm not sure many people know that, but their app is not available on Google Play because Google doesn't allow the game. So you have to side load it. Right? Wow. And when you sideload it, for anybody who sideloaded apps, you will know that your phone basically says, gives you like 10,000 warnings and warns you that your phone's gonna die and wow. there's like five viruses and all of that, right? So that's a unique support issue, which people reach out very frequently saying, hey, I downloaded the app, but my phone is saying it'll like, you know, you know conk off or it will explode right, it'll explode right now. Um, so all of those issues, you know, instead of, you know, traditionally the way they were handled was people would email um, and, you know, they would have to turn it around within a specified time frame. Also, the nature of the game, because it's so real time, they would have to respond to these emails very quickly because then that's a direct impact. So basically, the solution was implemented where instead of email, anybody could just send a message via chat, say the same things that, hey, my phone is about to explode or I'm having issues with my account or, you know, obviously the most classic problem, I did not get my money, right? Right. Um, and um, um, we implemented this, we, we, we took some time, worked closely with the team, and after it went live, during the IPL season, when they would traditionally have to hire these X number of people, we were able to automate about 80%, eight zero. So instead of 75, they, I think they ended up hiring, or they ended up having to staff up only by about 15. Um, wow. And that's live even now, so you can actually yeah. play around with it. So that for me, actually was funny. This was, 
still in the early stages of when we were going through our pivot about a year and a half, two years back. Um, and uh, it was possibly the first big realization even for me that, oh my God, this thing can work, <laughs> right? right? It was one of those things that, look, this is as, you know, proof of the pudding as you need in terms of what some of the impact this can have. Um, and that's was sort of a big... Actually, that's a very interesting thing. Um, and, you know, got me to think about the fact that we're looking at some ideas today where vernacular is going to become a lot larger part of yeah. certain businesses going forward. And with geo and everything else, you know, 500 million, 600 million, and maybe more over time. Um, and most of these folks, you know, maybe they're not even comfortable typing. Mm -hmm. And for most of them, you know, it'll be communicating through pictures or through voice. How do you see and think and believe that AI and AI led voice recognition will will have, I mean, would that, would we be able to use AI, you know, in voice? And, and if so, what, what kind of impact could that have, do you yeah, think? Yeah, so, you know, Firstly, obviously, we, you know, these are things that even sort of I am and we are learning along the way, right? One key distinction is that, look, AI can mean like 500 things and the specific piece of uh, um, of uh, voice recognition that sort of AI look, the specific part of voice recognition is the entire concept behind natural language understanding, right? So NLU is the one piece of AI that specifically goes I into, understand that well. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that specifically uh, goes into uh, goes into voice. Um, so, um, to answer your question, um, firstly on the voice bit, right? Um, completely agree with you, and we are huge believers that um, a large part of the internet audience that comes online as the next phase are going to be voice first users, specifically because of the vernacular uh, context, right? People. People um, in vernacular languages, you know, find it inconvenient to look to browse through regular interfaces. Exactly. Of uh, you know the geo, the graphical user interface of a mobile app or a website, and obviously they're never going to type, right? I think I think even if you look at WhatsApp's usage and WhatsApp's data, nobody ever types in local languages, and voice messages are very highly used. So, you know, and you took, you you obviously mentioned geo. Uh, you know, some of the data that they've been able to release around the usage of the geo phone and how people are actually using voice commands. Uh, so absolutely, that is a massive area. Um, I think um, everybody from Amazon, Google, us at, at the smaller scale, we're all working towards finding solutions within voice interfaces. There's obviously a lot of different paths that you could take. Again, it's like saying that it's the internet, right? Now, what does a voice-enabled application mean? You can do several things. You can do voice-based search. You can do voice-based customer support. You can build a voice interactive assistant like Alexa or Google Home. Um, and that's a very unique challenge to India to build it in all these different languages. Exactly. Particularly to build it in what we call Hinglish, right? Um, you know, you could still find data for like Hindi, Gujarati, and Marathi on different places. How do you aggregate data for mixed language? Right. Um, and also one of the things that we've seen in some of our early experiments with voice is that um, people are significantly more disciplined when typing. Okay. When people are typing, you know, you're, you're a lot more disciplined about the way you type, mm. you think about the words you use, you think about the language. When you talk, people really lose their discipline. Right, um, you know, you're not really like look, look, just the way we talk, right? I mean, there's I'm not thinking about punctuation marks. Right, I'm not thinking about what words in which order I'm using. That's just an incredible challenge to solve if you add the mixed language on top. Got it. If you add people speaking in two languages at the same time and not being disciplined at all, it's a very interesting problem which a lot of people are going after. Oh, okay. So maybe maybe just switch gears real quick um, and think about. Um, the question around AI a little bit more philosophically. Um, so during kind of the early years of my partner, Sid, growing up, I don't know where he is, but somewhere around here, um, the internet came about, you know, and... Uh, early years of that guy growing up? Yeah, you know, oh. exactly. Um, and so... Um, it was like the, I thought it was a DOS that was happening yeah, exactly. when, well, when yeah. you were growing up. <laughs> um, and you know, the thing is that you said something that triggered a thought that AI is kind of like the new internet, you know, which if we look back 
And had we known what we now know today, what the internet has created over the last 20, 25 years, um, I certainly know that a lot of us might have done things differently. You know, I don't know what that is yet, but I'm pretty sure we would be saying, you know, God damn it, maybe I should have just put, you know, my all my savings in Apple or Google or whatever and just call it a day. Or maybe learn coding. Or maybe learn coding. Exactly. Um, today, if you're saying, or a lot of people are saying, and what we're reading um, is this is now the new internet. You know, what should a lot of us, all of the young ones here do? You know? Including you. Including me. Yeah. Like, go back to school. Should we get a different job? I mean, what concerns me the most, just to be very clear, is that is the venture industry going to get AI'd? And, so and awesome. I would love that. Wait a that. second. Not, not that fast. Yeah. Not, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of people that have st spoken about this, which is, you know, our computer is going to be just far superior than us trying to make these decisions. You know, you nodding your head. Wait, we're just giving you an internship. Um, so, like, what should we be thinking about? What are the kind of things that would kind of equip us to become better 10, 15, 20 years from now, knowing perhaps what we saw in the movie, you know, in the last movie? Yeah, I don't know, man. Look, it's a, you know, to your point, it's a very philosophical, loaded question. And, you know, um, I'll be honest that, like, you know, it's, it's, we're all, you know, I'm not, I, I I struggle to imagine that time, some 20 years from now, like what's really going to happen? Like, are they going to be like, literally instead of like, you know, so many people, a bunch of sort of robots sitting in between us, you know, are there, is this going to be like, uh, you know, we won't, we won't need mics, for example, like there'll just be like, you know, a bunch of, a uh, uh, bunch of sensors that'll pick up our voice. I'll tell you what I think at least more, maybe more short term, right? Maybe more short term in terms of how I think about it. Um, and one of the things, maybe this is some context um, to answer this, but definitely one of the things I think about very often is that if and when I was to start another company, within the first three people that I would hire would be a data scientist. Um, even before potentially, you know, some other very key roles, what you would obviously think, right? But that would be, that would be one of the first key um, uh, team members that I would bring on board. One second. Actually, you guys have a data scientist? Not yet. Rahul? Not yet. Sid? Yes. Not? <laughs> no, no, where is, where is our friend Sid from Generico? There you go. We have a data scientist? We hired. Sure, right? What, what number was he? What number employee was he? <laughs> Borderline. But you know, Borderline. it's actually a very interesting point because as I go back to the experience I kind of shared in the beginning, Imbibe, I remember Aditi, and for those of you who know Aditi, you know, it, it's hard not to let her have her way. I mean, I fought her to, tooth and nail. She wanted to hire this really senior data scientist from McKinsey, you know, and uh, I mean, I just said no, flat out. Like, it's just paying him too much money. And she said, nope. This is what's going to change the game. And I think I sit here today saying, so glad that she just rolled right over me on that decision. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a case in point. We, um, starting next financial year, which is four days from now, uh, which is four days from now, the highest compensated person in Haptic will be the head of data science beyond the founders. Ignoring equity, of course, right? Beyond the founders would be the data scientist. And that's how much, obviously, we are in the business, so right. we have to do it, right? But even outside of that, um, you know, I just think any business, and we were talking about this on the phone, I think, right? I think even if you're selling t-shirts, right, there, there is an element in which you can build in predictability, you can build in supply chain efficiency. All of these are AI tools, all of this is machine learning, right? All of this is just understanding, predicting behavior. I, I often say this, I think one of the biggest AI implementations in this country is Ola Cabs. Yeah. Right. The, because of the because of the entire predictive, and of course, you know, you can take Uber, but I'm talking about India specific, right? Um, the amount of prediction they do, the way they map situations, all of that is nothing but a ton of data going in and basically helping you match with the right driver. So, any business anywhere, 
right? Including the venture business. I'm not sure if you guys have a data scientist, right? I think I would highly recommend uh, Prashant. Sorry, I forgot. Prashant is a data scientist. Um, maybe you should get an intern too, by the way. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's every business is, you know, using the right amount of data, firstly measuring it. I think it's underestimated and we just have, we took the f longest time forever and I think I, I, I particularly get really impressed by people who can figure out what's the right, right thing to measure and track. So I'll just stop here. Sandeep, I think you're way ahead of everyone. You know, one of the first people we had was a data scientist. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah, I mean, actually he started before me, you know, and uh, at the time we didn't have enough data. Yeah, but so <laughs> in deals. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> so. yeah. yeah I'm um, talking about the first three people, right? Nobody has yeah. any data, right? It's just that, okay, we were going to do something. And the moment data starts rolling in, like, let's, you know, kind of see what to do. He's with. A, a PhD. I mean, I'm not all kidding aside. We really had and we built a product and we needed more deals. So that's kind of where we are now. Yeah. Um, quick question before we head off. Um, a lot of talk and maybe it's in this book, um, universal pay. Yes or no? Um, Everyone know, understand universal pay? It's going to help people like me, you know, in the future. Yeah, so. but I mean, just curious. How does that, what does that have to do with AI? Oh, you're well, just asking me like, just because we're having wine. <laughs> you know, I think the, the story goes, right, between AI and automation and oh, okay. all this stuff. That's the fun stuff. Um, a, a bunch of us will be out of jobs and it'll create a massive imbalance in, you know, we might be start looting and all kinds of other <laughs> stuff. And so folks like Gates and Zuckerberg and others have been saying, you know, maybe we should just go into universal pay so that everybody's getting something, whether they're employed or not, and AI is gonna take their job or automation is gonna take their job or not. So I think, I, for me at least, I think they're unrelated. I think let's first talk about you know, this notion of AI taking away jobs. Okay. Um, you know, this is something that we've gone through as a company in terms of some of the things that we've done and something that honestly is a topic very close to my heart and, you know, something that I read about very often. I absolutely disagree with this notion that automation and AI will take away jobs. I think if you look at it historically, right, if you look at the past 50, 70, whatever, 100 odd years, right, any new automation or any new type of technology has always, in the long term, enabled more jobs, right? My favorite example is, it's like saying when the ATM came about, all the bank tellers lost their jobs, right? right. They, they found new things to do and they became more productive and they did better and they upskilled and all of that. Case in point is haptic. You know, I'm not going to be humble over here because we actually did this, right? We went through a cycle where we had a large number of people who were actually taking chats live. We, the customer support yeah. staff and all of that. We got to a point where, you know, all of it was getting AI enabled and it became sort of automated and everything. We upskill these guys to become AI trainers. Where what they do is they tag data, label data, um, they clean up data, they look at live conversations and see how much, how you can improve them. And all of them now, if you ask them, and I'm, you know, this is something I'm very proud of, they're happier at what they do because they don't feel like they're just Otherwise, machines responding back to conversations. They've been upskilled, which means their future, hopefully, career prospects are a lot better. Um, and I think in the long term, so short term, there might be some stress here and there. Okay, look, you know, somebody enabled this automation system that will let 40 people go. But in the long term, uh, it will absolutely create new opportunities and new jobs. And there'll be new types of jobs that will be created. Super. Okay, thanks a lot. And by the way, the the job thing, I'm not worried. I'm just a little bit ahead of AI. So I think it's for all of you guys to worry about.